The wind energy industry is becoming an increasingly important consumer of high-performance computing capabilities. Uh, many in various uh, fluid dynamics simulations and uh, uh, engineering optimizations. So I decided to make some videos about the wind turbine, which is actually a uh, truly remarkably efficient energy conversion machine. Uh, the aerodynamic community has always been a big user of HPC, and uh, the wind turbine is becoming a really important application of um, uh, aerodynamics. Before we talk about how the wind turbine works, let's spend some time to understand why the wind turbine actually works. Through human history, people have been inventing all kinds of machines. Some of them work, some of them don't. During a certain period of time, especially after the beginning of um, the Industrial Revolution, inventors were fascinated with the idea of a so-called perpetual motion machine. A kind of machine that can start itself, overcome all friction, and still has enough power left to do useful work. And the earliest documented design of such a machine is due to the Indian mathematician Bhaskara in 1159 AD. And it is called the Bhaskara wheel. This wheel, this wheel contains uh, curved reservoirs, those curved reservoirs, those are small containers, and th those containers, those reservoirs are partially filled with mercury. The reasoning, his reasoning was that as the wheel rotates, as the wheel rotates, the, the mercury always flows to the bottom of each of the reservoir. So, so, so if, um, if, um, so if the shape of the reservoir is designed properly, you can make sure that one half of the wheel, so say the left half, one half of the wheel always has more mercury than the right half. And the weight difference or the weight imbalance uh, can keep the wheel rotating forever. Um, but his design never worked. Right. So here is a sort of a time-lapsed view of this rotating wheel. Right. And those are uh, dark shaded area is um, the area that's occupied by mercury, and you can sort of see there are more mercury on the left side um, than on the right side of the wheel, right? And uh, this is um, this is sort of the time average of this particular rotating wheel. <coughs> Pascara's idea was later adopted and also generalized by uh, later inventors. And they have come up with many kinds of uh, different kinds of designs. Some of them using a rolling ball, for example, like this kind of thing. <coughs> rolling balls. So as the wheel rotates, the balls roll from uh, the center to the boundary, right? And uh, this kind of a rolling ball also makes one side of the wheel heavier than the other side. And uh, some of them using uh, weights. Some of, uh, some of them using weights that's attached to a swing arm, so as the wheel rotates, the arm actually swings. <coughs> and for the swing arm case, so for the swing arm design, if you look at, again, the time-lapsed or time-averaged view of the entire thing, if you actually uh, make you use a video to record the rotating uh, wheel and then play it back in a fast motion way, then you're going to see this kind of a, um, this kind of view, right? It's a kind of a time average view. Um, if you look at the time average of all the positions of the arms, you'll find that the swing weights that make one side of the wheel heavier also shifts the center of the weight to a position that's slightly below the rotating center, the axis of the wheel. <coughs> so the entire system, if you look at the entire system, the entire system is actually equivalent to a pendulum with a pivot that's at the axis of the rotating wheel, the rotation center, the rotation axis, and then with the weight of the pendulum at the center of the mass. So if you give it enough time, this system will change from rotating to swinging back and forth 
just like a ordinary pendulum. And eventually friction will win and the system will stop. So if you think about it, for all these designs, there are only two forces acting on the system. The friction, which basically converts mechanical energy to heat, and the gravity. Because the motion of the wheel is cyclic, so the motion of the weights, those either the rolling balls or those attached weights, their motion are cyclic too. So the work done by gravity as the mass moves down is of exactly the same size to the work the weight does against the gravity when it moves up back up. There's no net gain in energy per cycle. If you don't remember the definition of work in physics, it is actually the amount of energy given to or taken from an object by a force. So the fundamental reason, the fundamental reason that none of the perpetual machines work is because of is because they violate the first law of thermodynamics, which basically states that if you want a system to output energy, you must put energy into the system. So energy conversion from one form to another is feasible, but you can never manufacture energy out of nothing. So if the perpetual machine is not feasible, what is the next best thing? What is the next best thing? Right? The purpose of inventing the perpetual machine is to obtain the so-called free energy. We now know that there's no such thing as free energy. But if the input energy has no cost to us, we don't have to buy it, for example, right? And the conversion system itself is uh, economical enough, right? It's cheap enough. Then we may obtain something that is close enough to free energy, right? This free energy, the free in the sense of price, I mean, right? Uh, in the sense of economic sense, right? And modern wind turbines are actually very close to such a conversion system now, right? And as we sort of keep talking about it, you will see what I actually mean. The input energy is the wind energy, which does not cost anything, right? The only cost is the turbine itself, which is becoming more and more economical with the rapid advances in material sciences and engineering techniques. So, so, so this is actually a picture of the inside of a wind turbine. Right? That's the inside of a wind turbine. So you can see the rotor here. Right? You can see the rotor here, and then. Let's open the hood, open the cover on the on the on the on the uh, on the inside of the machine. Right. The wind turbine actually does two energy conversions. First, the kinetic energy in the wind, which is basically a large number of um, air molecules uh, moving in more or less the same direction. Right. The kinetic energy in the wind is converted into uh, the the mechanical energy of the shaft to make the shaft rotate, right? And but the output energy we want is actually electricity, right? We want electric energy. So the mechanical energy of the rotating shaft is then converted to electricity uh, using a generator. Right? So the main focus of all the following sequence of videos that I will try to produce is about these two conversions, right? The first the kinetic energy in the wind is converted to the mechanical energy of the rotating shaft, and then the mechanical energy of the rotating shaft is converted into electricity. Right? We'll talk about these two conversions in more detail. Right? Then you may ask, where does the kinetic energy in the wind actually come from? Right? Um, we will spend some time to discuss wind in more detail in later videos. For now, all we need to understand is that the wind is just air in motion. The Earth's atmosphere is also an energy conversion system, which receives uh, solar radiation as its energy input. Right? Because different parts of the atmosphere receives uh, different amounts of solar radiation, uh, 
they are heated to different temperatures, right? Uh, which causes uh, differences in atmospheric atmospheric pressure. So hot air rises and creates low pressure close to the ground, and then cold air sinks and creates high pressure close to the ground. This kind of a pressure difference actually drives the motion of the air. Then you may ask where the solar energy is actually coming from, right? I can tell you that the sun is also an energy conversion system, which converts nuclear energy into solar radiation. So inside the sun, inside the sun, you have four, it's actually combining four hydrogen nuclei uh, into one helium nucle nucleus. And this kind of a reaction is actually happening uh, extremely uh, at an ex extremely large rate, actually. And the total mass of the four hydrogen combined, four hydrogen nuclei combined, is actually slightly larger than the mass of the helium nucleus. So during this conversion, you are losing mass, actually. You are losing a slight amount of mass. Right? The lost mass during this reaction uh, is actually converted into energy, according to Einstein's uh, mass-energy equivalence equation, uh, that the famous E equals to mc squared. The energy equals to mass times the speed of the light squared. Right? Um, so, so that's the energy conversion happening inside of the sun. Right? Um, there are different types of wind at all sorts of scales, all sorts of spatial scales, right? Lots of different kinds of uh, winds. Um, we will discuss winds uh, in later videos, but for now, let's talk a little bit about the planetary scale, the biggest scale, planetary scale atmospheric circulation caused by differential heating. Right? At the planetary scale, you also have other kinds of wind, but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but for now, let's just look at uh, the wind that's caused by uh, uh, caused by differential heating of the solar energy. So at the equator, at the equator of the Earth, the temperature is high and hot air rises. Right, hot air rises to high altitude, so it creates a low pressure close to the ground. Right, cold air from mid altitude, the so cold air from the mid altitude is going to flow into it. It's going to flow into that low pressure created by the rising air at the equator. You can, no, you can notice that the path of those uh, flowing air is not straight, it's actually curved, right? It's bended. This is because of the Coriolis force due to the rotation of the Earth, right? These air motions is going to create a convection seal. And this kind of convection seal, these air motions uh, created seal, is called a Hadley seal, right? This is called a Hadley seal. And in the polar region, the opposite thing actually happens because um, because the temperature is low, so the cold air sinks, which creates a high pressure close to the ground, and this high pressure is going to drive cold air towards lower altitude, right? And uh, this kind of cycle, this kind of convection uh, seal, is called the polar seal, right? And uh, between the polar seal and the Hadley seal, there is a secondary convection seal that's actually driven by these two primary seals, right? And it's called a ferro seal. Um, so, so you can sort of see that uh, uh, just because of differential heating, right, you can have this kind of a planetary atmospheric circulations that's going to generate a wind. Right? Then you may ask why the polar regions are cold and the equator is hot, right? Because the sun is uh, very, very far away. The sun is like very, very far away. And because it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, very big, right? It's very, very big. So you can think of the, the incoming solar radiations as just those parallel ray paths, as those parallel rays, right? As those parallel rays. And those parallel rays are going to hit the surface of the Earth, right? And then you can actually compare the radiation, the rays that's actually hitting the equator and the rays that's actually hitting uh, close to the polar region, right? Um, the, it's the temperature actually depends very much upon the density of the radiation received on the surface of the Earth. So at the polar region or close to the polar region, right, because the radiation is incident 
at a very oblique angle, right? At the at the at the equator, the radiation is actually hitting the surface of the Earth head on, right? It's vertical, it's perpendicular. But close to the pole, the radiation is actually hitting the surface of the Earth at a very oblique angle, right? If it's at a very oblique angle, it means that the same amount of radiation energy is being spread out over a much larger region than the equator. Right? This is a much larger region than this uh, smaller region. Right? And uh, you can actually illustrate this idea with just a uh, flashlight. For example, if you have a flashlight, if you have a flashlight, if you actually try to shine the flashlight onto a surface at a very oblique angle, like this kind of situation, the area that's covered by the by, by, by the light is much bigger so so the density the density of the light is being is a smaller is smaller per area right but if you actually hit the shine on the surface head on then the same amount of light is shine is uh, lighting up a smaller area so the density is actually higher right and that's sort of the first order effect right there are also some second order reasons right for example if the incident angle is very oblique then the ray path is longer, so more radiation energy is absorbed or scattered by the atmosphere before the ray actually hits the ground, right? because the ray path is longer. And then in the solar region, the ground is covered by snow and ice, which actually can reflect as much as 75 to 95 percent of received solar radiation. So much of the incoming energy is um, bounced back, actually. So that's why the wind turbine actually works based on the consideration of the first principle of thermodynamics. Right? Uh, but in order to actually make it economical, in order to make the wind conversion, uh, wind energy conversion, to be economical, so you can make a profit out of it, you also have to consider the efficiency of the conversion, right? And uh, that will involve the second law of thermodynamics, which basically states that entropy always increases, right? And we'll talk about that in the next video.